1979, a revolution topples Iranian ruler Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, and with that, a monarchy of more than 2,500 years. I have zunächst nicht an einem Umbruch geglaubt. That's the way authoritarian regimes fall. First gradually, and then suddenly. The Shah's mistake was to want to do too much too fast. Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, Persia's last emperor, was a key figure in world politics in the second half of the 20th century. His fiercest opponent, Ruhollah Musavi Khomeini. The Ayatollah becomes the bearer of hope for all those who are against the Shah. The two are against Poland, so as their political image, so as their two persons. They became very fierce antagonists, absolutely. And the Shah developed a, an almost obsession with them. Their rivalry lasted for almost their entire lives. In the end, the Shah is defeated. The Ayatollah is victorious, and with him, Islamic fundamentalism, a new challenge for world politics. In September 1941, a young man becomes the new ruler of Iran. At just 21 years of age, Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi is sworn in as the new head of state in the Iranian parliament, in the middle of the Second World War. His father, Reza Shah Pahlavi, had remained neutral. But he made no secret of his sympathies for the Nazi regime. The Allies demanded his resignation. Since Hitler's attack on the Soviet Union, the British and the Americans depend on Iran for their transport of heavy war materials to Russia, for the fight against the German Reich. Als der Vater nach seiner Abdankung Iran verlassen hat, blieb Mohammad Reza zurück. Also der Vater Reza Shah hat ihn auch zurückgelassen, hat eben auch gesagt, du musst das hier übernehmen, du bleibst hier. Mohammed Reza had been prepared for this task by his father from an early age. Among his siblings, he has a special role as crown prince. His father selects his playmates and sends him to a Swiss elite boarding school to give him a Western education. Finally, he tells him who to marry. It's the Egyptian princess Fauzia. With the arranged marriage between the two dynasties, the father wants to reinforce the Pahlavi's power in Iran. And he was a very, very powerful, charismatic figure who completely dominates the son's life. 300 kilometers southwest of Tehran, the oasis town of Khomein is situated. In 1902, Rahula Musavi Khomeini is born in a house on the outskirts of that town, the youngest of six children. He never meets his father. His father is murdered when he is five months old under suspicious circumstances. Khomeini will later hold Risa Shah accountable. Until the end of his days, Ayatollah Khomeini thought that uh, Reza Shah personally had uh, intervened and to save the murder. That was that bitterness left in him because uh, in his writings, you know, every now and then he says uh, those whose fathers have been killed by Reza Shah. Khomeini grows up without a father. This will impact him all his life. His mother takes Khomeini to a wealthy aunt who makes sure he receives a good education. At five years of age, Khomeini starts school. A village teacher teaches him how to read and write. He's a fast learner. Among his classmates, he's the most gifted. While others play, he studies and reads the Quran. 
Before Risa Shah was forced to abdicate, he had started extensive reforms in Iran. He wanted Persia to become a modern state. This included the fact that women were no longer allowed to wear a shador, the traditional veil. The clergy saw this as an assault on religious matters and protested. For Khomeini, who was studying Islamic theory of law by then, this was a fundamental violation of the principles of Islam. Khomeini was a political, spiritual, also before he really publicly appeared. Ähm, kann man das auch festmachen an seinen Schriften. Also wir haben ein Traktat von ihm, Kashful Asrar, also die Enthüllung der Geheimnisse, heißt dieser Titel. Darin ähm, greift er sehr stark Reza Shah an. Reza Shah's abdication under pressure from the Allies must have been greatly gratifying for him. He demands that Iran will now be ruled according to Islamic law again. This demand doesn't have any effect yet. Risa Shah dies in exile in South Africa in 1944. If not before, now with his son transferring the body, all eyes are on the new Shah. People wonder how he will solve the conflict with the clergy, which he inherited from his father. So far, he'd been perceived as rather restrained by the public. As Shakespeare says, some have greatness thrust upon them and some seize greatness. Muhammad Reza Shah had the monarchy seized, uh, thrown upon him. And there was a big difference with someone who goes and grabs power and creates the modern state to uh, with someone who was essentially a reluctant king. The young Shah acts surprisingly resolutely. Like his father, he wants to modernize state and society, but end his father's confrontational course with the clergy. His subsequent opponent, Khomeini, now teaches Islamic theory of law. He finds a sympathetic ear in younger students who become radicalized. One group names themselves fadayan e islam These martyrs of Islam are Shiite fundamentalists. They come from the ghettos of Tehran and demand the establishment of a theocratic state on the basis of the Quran. Any Western influence is to be banned. Women must wear veils in public again. Within a couple of years, they really became very important because, they, first of all, they assassinated a top intellectual, Mr. Ahmad Kasravi who campaigned against uh, Islam as a whole. Then they proceeded further and assassinated the prime minister, General Razmara. And uh, Khomeini was uh, uh, the cleric who gave them a clerical cover. Because, you know, in, in Islam, or at least in Shiite Islam, you can't go, just go and kill somebody unless a clerical authority writes a fatwa, as, for example, like Khomeini wrote against Salman Rushdie. In early 1949, there's an assassination attempt on the Shah as well. It was probably carried out by a terror group, but this has never been proven. The Iranian parliament blames the Moscow following Today party and bans it. This comes in useful for the Shah, for communist ideology is equally as suspicious to him as is radical Islam. His political path is directed towards the West. I'm looking forward with the keenest anticipation to all that I have to experience here in the greatest of the democracies in a free world. In November 1949, the American president, Harry S. Truman, and the American people welcomed Shah Mohammad Reza exuberantly but not exactly selflessly. They want to secure access to the huge oil reserves in Iran. The Shah, on the other hand, needs support for his plans to modernize Iran from the bottom. He's interested in all technical innovations like the Hoover Dam. Not everyone likes his enthusiasm for the West. Das Land war total abhängig. Der Schah war abhängig 
von den Amerikanern und von den Briten. Und äh, wir wollten ein unabhängiges Land haben. Ein Land, das sein Schicksal selbst in die Hand nimmt, selbst entscheidet. The global economic boom after the war requires fuel. Oil. In Abadan, near the Persian Gulf, the world's greatest refinery is built. Since the beginning of the 20th century, oil production had been mainly in British hands. In Iran, the Anglo-Iranian oil company is like a state within a state. When the Iranian parliament decides to nationalize the oil industry in March 1951, Great Britain pulls the oil plug on Iran. Many British experts have to leave the country. The takeover of the oil facilities by a national company is cheered on boisterously. But the oil embargo soon forces the country's economy to its knees. Extremist parties like the Communist Today Party take advantage. They become very popular. The Shah temporarily flees into exile, out of the line of fire. The mullahs and their followers, and different political groups like the communists who aim for the abolition of the monarchy and a people's republic, fight for dominance in Iran. The Shah only manages to stay in power through the intervention of the USA. The American Secret Service, CIA, supports him with a lot of money and helps him to establish his own secret service, the Sabak. Our Shah became a kind of Roman uh, Caesar. You know, involved in day-to-day uh, -day business, involved in day-to-day -day wars, and if, like the Roman Caesar, you become involved in day-to-day, -day, like Julius Caesar, somebody will kill you. During this time, Khomeini doesn't make any public statements on political questions. He withdraws to his house in the holy city of Qom, where he lives with his wife and children. Only his most dedicated followers come to see him, but they don't say a word about what Khomeini discusses with them either. In solitude, the clergyman continues his work on his ideas for the Islamization of the Iranian state, discreetly but with confidence. He is extremely confident when he meets the Shah in person. On behalf of the Grand Ayatollah, Khomeini asks the Shah to pardon one of the assassins from the terror group fadayan e islam successfully. The Shah definitely wants dialogue with the mullahs. He keeps going on pilgrimages to Mecca in Saudi Arabia, Islam's central pilgrimage site. As a Muslim, he shows respect for Islam and accepts the religious authority of the Imams. But such publicity performances always serve multiple interests. His religious feelings, I think, came from his mother. Uh, we know his mother was very religious. Uh, his father clearly was not. His politics towards religion has nothing to do with his religiosity. His politics to religion has to do with his fear that the greatest threat to Iran will come from the communists. And that the way to fight the communists is by strengthening religion. And that's exactly what he does. Any ally in the fight against the influence of the communist Soviet Union is fine with the Shah. Therefore, he tries to win over the clergy, which was traditionally anti-communist and monarchist. It's a calculation which won't add up. He certainly thought that that ideological backing was religion. Uh, and that's, again, another mistake that he made. Uh, uh, religion, as uh, particularly as incarnated by the Shia clergy, could never have become um, the ideological framework on which to build modernization and westernization. In December 1959, there are pompous festivities in Tehran. Tabloid reporters from all over the world fight for the best picture of Mohammad Reza Shah and Farah Diba. 
After two divorces, the new queen needs to produce the desired successor to the throne so that the Pahlavi dynasty can live on. Farah Diba becomes an influential woman at the side of her husband. She also accompanies him on his trip to America in April 1962, where the couple are received frenetically. The Shah seeks to deepen Iranian-American relations with President John F. Kennedy. Both agree that only a strong military can fend off the latent threat of the Soviet Union. Arming Iran is a done deal. For the Americans, it's a valuable business. Weapons for oil. Die Amerikaner haben die modernsten Waffen dem Schar zur Verfügung gestellt. Seine Militärs aufgebaut. Es gab unzählige militärische Berater im Iran. Die haben äh, bestimmt, was gemacht wird und was nicht gemacht wird. Und alles, was sie gemacht haben, war, diente bestimmt nicht der Demokratie. In the 1960s, Iran was still a developing country. Most of the people were farmers without their own land. The land belonged to feudal masters and land barons, including a number of mullahs and religious trusts. On the 11th of January 1963, the Shah introduces an extensive program of reforms. He calls it the White Revolution. Its aim is to markedly improve the conditions of life for the people. انقلاب سفید موقعی که علیزاد تصمیم گرفتن واقعا تصمیم و فکر خودشون بود برای که همونطور که گفتم ایشون میخواستن مملکتشون هم وطنانشون پیشرفته بشن جلو برن A national referendum strengthens the ambitious program which includes the abolition of the feudal system privatization of state-owned companies the fight against illiteracy and the introduction of women's voting rights Women are not allowed to take part in the referendum yet. However, they flock to the polling stations to demonstrate their approval. He wanted Iran to modernize. The white revolution was intended to make Iran better. And it did. In many, many ways, it did. It ended feudalism in Iran. That's not an easy thing to do. The starting point of the white revolution was a land reform against the determined resistance of the clergy. The Shah hands over more than 500,000 hectares of land, an area twice the size of Luxembourg, to some 30,000 destitute families. یه دلیل این بود که فکر می کردیم، یعنی گفته می شد در اون زمان شایع بود که زیر فشار آمریکایی ها رژیم شاه این کار کرده. بنابراین این برای تامین کننده هدف های استعماری امپریالیستی و به نفع مردم ایران نیست. و یه چیز فرمایشی هست به دستور خارجی ها به دستور آمریکایی ها In order for children to learn reading, writing and maths, soldiers teach them in village schools. Adult farmers and nomads have to go back to school. The Shah involves all strata of the population in his campaign. Es gab eine Armee zur Alphabetisierung und nicht tatsächliche Bildung. Und äh, ich meine, es ist gut, wenn die Leute alphabetisiert sind, aber Alphabetisierung bedeutet nicht politische Bildung. Das ist ein, ein sehr großer Unterschied. Und politische Bildung wurde überhaupt sowohl an den Schulen als auch an den Universitäten verboten. Khomeini takes on the role of a mouthpiece for a group of mullahs who reject this policy as pro-Western. در اون زمان آیت الله خمینی عنوان فردی شمرده می شد که این خواسته های مردم رو خواسته های معترضان و مخالفان رو بازگو می کرد و با شجاعت و شاهامت اینها رو پیگیری می کرد از این جهت هم ما از آیت الله خمینی حمایت می‌کردیم. خمینی war zu der Zeit, als er dann wirklich öffentlich auftrat, eben nicht mehr 
der junge Geistliche, der vorher war in Rom, der sich über die Sauschau beschwert hatte, der sich dann eben auch zurückhielt aus Respekt vor seinen Lehrern, sondern zu der Zeit war er dann eben auch schon Großeiertoller, hatte sich dann eben auch schon eine ansehnliche Anhängerschaft versammelt und konnte dann natürlich auch, hatte ein ganz anderes Mobilisierungspotenzial. Khomeini takes advantage of his gain in power. He abandons his hitherto withdrawn position and openly opposes the Shah's politics. For the first time, he publicly warns him not to carry on with his father's ways. Khomeini sent a couple of letters directly addressed to the Shah, and the Shah gave a couple of lectures, speeches, directly responding to him. Uh, uh, I've quoted those at length in the Shah book, and they're remarkable. Khomeini, for his defiance, telling the Shah, boy, don't do something so that I throw you out of the country like your father. And the Shah saying these little, uh, 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 the word is uh, like ants, like uh, uh, who survive in feces. We are not going to let them rule this country. Strengthening the role of women in Iranian society is an integral part of the White Revolution. Iranian women grasp this opportunity to make public use of their newly acquired rights and the associated self-confidence. Women can not only vote now, they can also become political candidates. For Iranian women, this is a milestone on their path to emancipation. آزادی زنان که خیلی مهم بود برصد حقوقی که زنان گرفتن بعد در مقایسه با خیلی ممالک اروپایی جلوتر بود but there was a lot of uh, resistance and and uh, uh, the, the first revolution in 63 happened uh, led by Khomeini happened specifically uh, on this particular item of the voting uh, Degree. For Khomeini and his followers, the new role of women in politics and society is a threat to the foundation of their faith. They mount a counter-attack. Khomeini denounces corruption, state violence, and the torture used by the state's secret service, Savak. He threatens the tyrant of our time in a speech with a black reaction to the white revolution. Khomeini war der Einzige, der sehr radikal damals äh, gegen den Schah sich geäußert hat. Er hat äh, ihm gedroht, äh, dass er ihn als äh, einen sündhaften Menschen, äh, religiös sündhaften Menschen äh, darstellen würde. Und er hat äh, gedroht, einen Aufstand gegen ihn zu organisieren. There are demonstrations and counter demonstrations. The Shah deploys the military to the holy city of Qom. Blood is shed. Khomeini is arrested and sentenced to death. Thanks to the pleading of numerous clerics, the sentence is changed and Khomeini is exiled to Najaf in Iraq. In the meantime, the implementation of the White Revolution is more difficult for the rural population than expected. The farmers now have their own fields to till, but they often lack seeds, water and modern agricultural machines. نتیجه این شد که این اصلاحات ارزی سبب شد که روستایی‌ها در ده نمی‌تونستان بمونن. راهی شهرها شدن راهی شهرستان شدن راهی تهران شدن بعد در تهران هم چون اینا در داخل شهر نمیتونستن زندگی بکنن آمیدان حاشیه نشین شهرها شدن و همین حاشیه نشین ها بودن در دوره انقلاب جزء سربازان انقلاب شدن if you're going to end feudalism and you're going to bring millions of people into the city you have to be prepared for it you have to think who is going to teach these people the political uh, rules of the new game? And then he made it impossible for anyone other than the clergy to have a political organization in Iran. 
At first, Khomeini completely secludes himself in his exile in Najaf, a stronghold of Shiite Islam in Iraq. At 60, he believes he's finished. He's isolated. Many Iraqi scribes don't want to have anything to do with his political activities. He immerses himself in his studies of the Holy Scriptures again. He only communicates with very few of his pupils to stay abreast of the situation in Iran. One of his few pillars is his family, who have followed him into exile. He was this distant figure, very little interest in anything other than his mosque and his books. He never went once two blocks from his house the other side to see a river. He went to his mosque and came home for 14 years. Meanwhile, in Iran, in October 1967, the Shah continues the grandeur of the old days. The Shah had always stressed that he wanted to achieve something for his country before ascending the peacock throne with all honors. Now, he has himself crowned emperor in Tehran. The clergy supports him. The Shah has always factored the clergy into his public appearances. He knows how important it is, especially for the ordinary people, to reference the religious foundation of the ruling dynasty. Now it seems he has arrived. He is the Shahanshah, the king of kings. And he also crowns his wife empress, something that has never happened before in Persia's long history. همیشه میگم موقعی که علی زاد تاج به سر من گذاشتن مثل که تاج به سر تمام زنان ایران گذاشتن و خب در تاریخ مملکت ما خیلی مهم بود این و و راستش من اینقدر فکر نمیکردم که من مهم شدم میدونید واقعا فکر میکردم که یه کاری برای پیش بردن و احترام به زنان in May and June 1967, the glamorous couple is on a state visit in West Germany. They are welcomed by Federal President Lübcke and Federal Chancellor Kiesinger. The visit mainly serves economic interests. The Shah visits the big steel companies along the Rhine and Ruhr rivers, because he needs support for the industrialization of his country, for instance, with the construction of new reservoir dams for the irrigation of farmland. It's a lucrative opportunity for the German economy. Man hat das Potenzial des Marktes gesehen. Die Banken waren auch beteiligt und daran interessiert, als Finanzier für derartige Dinge in Frage zu kommen, so dass das eigentlich ein, ein Geben und Nehmen war. When the ruling couple visits the German Opera in Berlin, the ugly face of the Shah regime is revealed. Members of his secret service, Sabak, attack demonstrators who are protesting against suppression and torture in Iran. The situation escalates. The visit of the Shah and the protests against his politics mark a turning point in the history of West Germany. In Tehran, the Shah's monument, which Faradiba had commissioned, is meant as an architectural expression of the new modern identity of the empire. In the old imperial city of Persepolis, on the other hand, the Shah commemorates the Persian Empire's 2,500 years of history with an ostentatious celebration. In 1971, the biggest party in the world is held in the middle of the desert. Monarchs, heads of state, and dictators attend. The population is not invited. It was one of those things that the intention was well, but the execution uh, went so much in exaggerated way, mixed with cronyism and corruption, that I think it backfired on him. In order to lead the white revolution to success, the Shah upgrades the technology of the country with the help of capital assistance from abroad. He invests billions in electrification and numerous other industries. He wants Iran to get in with modernity and become great again. 
just like the Persian Empire was historically. I think that our, our country in the next 10 years will be what you are today. In the next 25 years, according to other people, I'm not saying that, will be among the five most prosperous countries of the world. To this end, the Shah also invests in nuclear energy. US, American and French companies want to do this lucrative deal. In the end, however, it's West German businesses who signed the deal with Iran. Natürlich waren wir stolz, dass wir den Auftrag bekamen, das erste Atomkraftwerk im Iran zu bauen, also Siemens KWU. Auf der anderen Seite habe ich mich natürlich gefragt, warum baut ein Land, das unendlich viele Energiereserven Öl und Gas hat, warum bauen die überhaupt ein teures Atomkraftwerk? Einmal spielte natürlich für die deutsche Wirtschaft auch der Opportunismus eine Rolle. Wir waren interessiert zu liefern oder zu investieren. The motivation came from the necessity of his time, whether we like it or not. Uh, modernization is to a large extent westernization. You can't modernize without westernizing. The capital, Tehran in particular, opens itself up to the cultural lifestyle of the West and becomes a modern metropolis. Veiled women are now hardly to be seen anywhere in the town. Young people are allowed to travel without restrictions and educate themselves. They enjoy all the advantages of a cosmopolitan city and show no inhibitions. On the other hand, the political power structures don't change at all. They remain traditionally monarchist and tailored to the Shah. Er wollte alles alleine entscheiden. Und das war der Fehler, der erstens alle Misserfolge, die er hatte, erklärt und letztendlich auch das, was zu seinem Ende geführt hat. و وزرای شاه جرأت نمی‌کردند به شاه بگویند وضعیت اقتصاد کشور خراب است. اینا همه ناشی می‌شد از این تغییر از بالا اونم به شیوه استبدادی که پر از فساد بود و جنایت‌ها و کشتن روشنفکران فراری دادن روشنفکران و خیانت لحاظ که ایران رو زیر سلطه بیگانه نگاه می‌داشت. In contrast, in Najaf in Iraq, time seems to have stood still. Khomeini holds lectures for a small circle of students. He thinks about what an Islamic legal system could be like with the clergy taking on a leading role. He condemns the shallowness and pure sensual pleasures of the West, attacks the colonial powers and Israel, and demands the end of separation of politics and religion. The transcripts of the lectures are published in a book about the Islamic State. I think I was one of the maybe first people to read it. I was shocked by it. But I, like a lot of other simple people like me, thought this would never work. This is a medieval idea. Iran, that has had a constitutional revolution in 1905-07, is not going to let the clergy come and cut off people's hands in public squares. And it's not going to let the clergy rule because they know Sharia. I was wrong, as were a lot of other countries and forces. In Iran, this book about the Islamic State is not published, but banned. They want to prevent the radical ideas and theological demands of the Shiite cleric from spreading. But the censorship only increases the fascination Khomeini's book holds for the opponents of the ruling class. کتاب ولایت فقیهشون رو چند سال پیش از پیروزی انقلاب من خودم بارها عرض کنم که تو شهرستان ها بردم جاهای مختلف بردم دادم به دست افراد و البته این در حالی بود که اگر واقعا این کار ما به دست ساواک میرسید ساواک متوجه میشد خیلی 
به صلاح برای ما سنگین تمام می شد گران تمام می شد ولی در این حال ما این کار انجام می دادیم Those who politically oppose the Shah's regime face imprisonment in the Iranian secret service Savak's prison where torture and executions are daily fair This was one thing the students had demonstrated against when the Shah visited Germany There is no getting out of the dreaded detention center which was built by German architects in the 1930s Iranian politicians who are active today, like the current supreme religious leader Ali Khamenei, were imprisoned there during the reign of the Shah. Did they do bad things? Absolutely. Did they torture people? Absolutely. You can't forget that they actually did torture people. They tortured a lot of people. They executed a lot of people. Uh, but the opposition was also very successful in exaggerating the number of people who were in prison. We used to say in the Confederation that there, that there are hundreds of thousands of prisoners in Iran. The actual number was about 4,000. Dissent, or worse, resistance, had no place in the Shah's regime. There is no open political dialogue on the country's social and political development. The parties, from left to right, are mostly silenced. The opposition has fled abroad or is imprisoned. The Shah's autocratic regime results in him losing contact with the people in his country more and more. Das Land entwickelt sich nur dann, wenn die Menschen eine gewisse Autonomie bekommen. Das heißt wenn sie das eigene Schicksal selbst in die Hand nehmen. Das ist ein Prozess der Demokratie. Ohne Demokratie, ohne Teilnahme der Bevölkerung läuft nichts. For instance, the dealers on the markets play an important social role in Iran. Millions of people come and shop with them every day. The Shah, however, doesn't really take the bazaaris, the market dealers, into consideration in his politics of westernization. Department stores, chain stores and supermarkets like the ones you can find in the West threaten their livelihood. The Shah doesn't realize the consequences of his policies and how many enemies he creates for himself with them. The Iran Revolution was not just a rein islamische Revolution, sondern vereinte eben ganz unterschiedliche Kräfte, die eben auch in der iranischen Geschichte sehr stark waren. Deshalb würde ich das nicht reduzieren wollen auf so eine ähm, geistige Opposition gegenüber dem Pahlavi-Staat. Tehran in particular, with its modern high-rise buildings, becomes the symbol of this belief in progress. But many people can't keep up with the Shah's pace. So they turn to that institution which is familiar to them and which gives them security in their insecurity. It completely went after the left, whether it was the left that was dependent on the Soviet Union or whether it was the social democratic left. The only people who were allowed to build mosques, build uh, schools, teach their own cadres were the religious folks. And you, you bring millions into the cities in shanty towns, concentrate them, make them easy to mobilize, and allow the clergy to uh, be the only one who's active there. And then people are surprised that the revolution was won by the clergy. The Shah has many mosques renovated in the 1970s. The number of Quran schools also rises immensely. This way, he wants to assure the clergy how important Islam as an essential foundation of Iranian society is to him, despite focusing his politics on the West. With his public appearances and his annual pilgrimages to the city of Mashhad, which is one of the seven holy cities of Islam, he hopes to keep the clergy securely on his side. He saw religion as his last line of defense. He saw religion as his uh, most powerful 
a stronghold within the country. And that's where he made a massive miscalculation, massive strategic and ideological miscalculation and political miscalculation because what he thought of as his most powerful stronghold and backing turned out to be his most uh, fatal and dangerous enemy. The first protest marches against the Shah take place in Qom in 1978. The reason is a defamatory article against Khomeini, which is published in a big Iranian daily newspaper. The article accuses him and the clergy of counter-revolution. His followers organize a demonstration of support. It was a very the fast moving uh, revolution. Maybe it is uh, the fastest revolution in human history because everything happened within four months. With every passing day, the resolve of the Shah's regime to stay in power uh, was weakening and the resolve of the opposition to demand his removal was increasing. There were fatalities during this demonstration in Qom. According to Islamic custom, the dead are commemorated every 40 days. Soon, hundreds of thousands take to the streets. Each time, there are more of them. The Shah wasn't anticipating this kind of resistance. It catches him and his regime completely off guard. The growing power of the streets paralyzes him. On August the 19th, 1978, an arson attack on Cinema Rex in the oil city of Abadan kills 422 people. The opposition blames the Iranian secret service and the Shah. Later on, there's a growing body of evidence for the clergy being behind the attack, with Khomeini as the mastermind in the background. After Cinema Rex, it was a different story, both in magnitude, in the anger, and in the slogans. For the first time I heard, Thousands of people say death to the Shah. That would have been unimaginable in 77. The protest of the masses turns into open violence. Tehran is ablaze. The military intervenes. On the 8th of September, 1978, a day which will go down in Iranian history as Black Friday, 64 people are killed on the central Jale Square. The opposition claims there were 15,000 deaths. A general strike ensues, paralyzing the country. Ich habe verfügt über ein starkes Militär und Geheimdienste und dergleichen mehr. Also alle Instrumente der Macht hat er in der Hand. Deswegen haben viele gedacht, auch so wie ich, Erstmal versuchen wir äh, mit Khomeini das Regime zu stürzen. Danach äh, wird man schon mit ihm fertig werden. At the behest of the Shah, the government declares Khomeini a persona non grata. He's forced to leave his exile in Najaf. His confidants advise him to leave for Europe, which he declines at first. What is he to do in a non-Islamic country? He is wrong. When he goes to neufle le chateau a little suburb of Paris, thousands of his followers from all over the world flock there. Western politicians and intellectuals like Jean-Paul Sartre, Michel Foucault and François Mitterrand also support Khomeini. In France, he suddenly finds himself the center of the global public. He was suddenly catapulted into an international celebrity and was much more clever than the Shah, the British, the Iranian opposition uh, gave him credit for. Because initially the idea was that they would send him to Neufle Chateau and he would become an embarrassment. He would say reactionary things and would frighten people. Well, he didn't say the reactionary things. He was very careful. He never once, in a hundred, I think, ten interviews, never once mentioned the word Velayta Fari. Khomeini mentions none of the radical ideas he expressed in his book on the Islamic State. 
Since his writings are banned in Iran and unknown in the West, no one can confront him with them. His speeches against the Shah are recorded and distributed in Iran. ما به هر شکلی که بود این بیانیه و اطلاعیه رو به این ورانور پخش می‌کردیم نوار کاستش این ورانور می‌بردیم پخش می‌کردیم و خب اینها نوارهای کاست ها عمق روستاها هم می‌رفت The generals in Iran are waiting for the Shah to give them the order to crack down on the insurgents but he is weakened by cancer and doesn't signal anything of that sort the military is perplexed and backs off When the soldiers stop shooting at the people, the people put flowers in their guns and give them pictures of Khomeini. They celebrate their new leader. In a televised appeal to the Iranian people, the Shah wants to change tack one more time. من نیز پیام انقلاب شما ملت ایران را شنیدم. تضمین می کنم که حکومت ایران در آینده بر اساس قانون اساسی، عدالت اجتماعی و اراده ملی he looked weak, he looked absolutely despondent, uh, he couldn't read the text. Uh, and the point that he was saying uh, is that I have heard, that's the famous phrase, I have heard the uh, call of your revolution and uh, give me another chance. Uh, and people saw it rightly as a sign of his weakness. If ever there was a sign that he is not going to be able to master the situation, that was, to me, the speech. The crisis in Iran also causes ripples at international level. French President of State Giscard d'Estaing invites the German Chancellor Helmut Schmidt, US President Carter and British Prime Minister Callaghan to Guadeloupe for a conference. Here, they decide on the fate of Iran. Nos entretiens ont fait apparaître un double objectif, accroître la sécurité et réduire les tensions dans le monde. Euh, il nous est apparu que la reconnaissance légitime des réalités du monde contemporain doit s'accompagner de la poursuite des efforts pour améliorer les relations internationales. This means that the Western powers drop the Shah and his regime. On the 16th of January 1979, the Shah and his family leave Iran. The Shah expects the crisis to be over soon so that he can return. It turns out to be a farewell for good. I don't want The Shah was a good king for the time of peace. He wasn't a good king for the time of big trouble. He was really a double personality. Uh, when he felt strong, he was extremely uh, self-assured. And the first signs of weakness made him uh, very, very timid. There was no other figure. Mr. Khomeini became uh, the point of uh, union. 14 days later, on the 1st of February 1979, Khomeini flies from Paris to Tehran. No one knows how this journey will end. Will the Shah's military force the plane to turn back or even shoot it down to prevent Khomeini from returning? آقای خمینی هم چیزی ظاهر نمیکرد که دل خوره داره ولی قاین آقای بشر دیگه او هم این دل خوره رو می داشت After 14 years of exile Khomeini now steps onto Iranian soil again Millions of people frenetically celebrate his return After 2500 years the Persian monarchy has outlived its usefulness Khomeini is received as the new savior. No one has any idea of the consequences which the Islamic revolution will have for the Iranian state.
Virtually all our intellectuals supported Khomeini, from right to left, including those who had supported the Shah. Uh, all our big business, you know, our big tycoons, you know, our billionaires, they all supported him. So he had created a degree of unity uh, among uh, all these different factions in uh, Tehran, which was impressive. Khomeini's first visits are to the behesht e zahra Cemetery on the outskirts of Tehran, where the victims of the Shah regime are buried, and to the holy city of Qom, where his resistance began many years before. The confrontation between these two could be summarized to the confrontation of two opposing will. And in such a confrontation, it is always the stronger will that will win, you know. And that's what uh, exactly what happened in Iran. Uh, Khomeini's will was far stronger to conquer power than the Shah's will to keep power. After an odyssey through several countries, the Shah dies of terminal cancer in Cairo on the 27th of July, 1980. He lived to be 60 years of age. His body is buried in the Al Rifai Mosque in the Egyptian capital. Ayatollah Khomeini dies of a heart attack on the 3rd of June 1989 in Tehran. His resting place is a mausoleum. During his 10 year reign, he implemented his ideas of an Islamic revolution with uncompromising vigor and turned Iran into a theocracy, thus setting a dynamic in motion which even today keeps the world in suspense.